Hello, Emil Kalinowski speaking here, and this podcast is being recorded and released on March 23rd, 2021. For those of you perusing your favorite financial media, you may notice there's much talk of an anniversary. And indeed, there is an anniversary to commemorate today because it's a day that no financial market will soon forget. It was the day that America's S&P 500 put in its low and stock prices began to climb to what looks like a permanently high plateau. But why March 23rd? I'll tell you why. Because Jeff Snyder and I decided that what the world really needed in a time of COVID and financial Armageddon was another financial podcast and that we were going to give it to him to commemorate the anniversary of the podcast of the show of making sense. I proposed to Jeff that we do a retrospective. Jeff responded. He would love to really, but he was reading through the Federal Open Market Committee's August 20th, 1974 Memorandum of Discussion again. And so, instead, let me provide you with a retrospective of sorts by playing the top 10 podcast introductions as voted on by me, the introducer. The podcast introductions are just that. They're not found on the YouTube show. They're only found on on the podcast and starting with episode 14 last year and continuing through episode 58 this week what i do is i introduce the points of discussion with the purpose of enticing ensnaring you the dear listener and in two to three minutes i have to convey the topics in an educational or funny or poignant or enthusiastic or absurd way sometimes i use a metaphor other times a literary, a literary reading sometimes i can pronounce literary and other times i cannot so it's always an adventure and the top 10 will kick off by going to episode 43. Episode 43 is an absurd introduction, but I loved it. And it's called Modern Monetary Hypnosis, posted just this year, January 24th, 2021. As many listeners have long suspected, your podcaster host did, as a child, run away and join the circus. Not dissimilar from a traditional childhood, it was your classic gypsy camp. If children misbehaved, we would be locked into stocks or were thrown into a cage and hoisted into the fly tower, dangling precariously over the stage. Our ringmaster, Giuseppe Grimaldi, was horribly morbid living in perpetual fear of death and especially of being buried alive. When he finally died, his will directed that his eldest daughter cut his head from his corpse, just to be certain. Sure, perhaps a little quirky, but certainly not the oddest troupe, not Pandemonium Carnival. So, looking to make a career of it, your podcaster tried his hand at clown work. But by that time, famous clowns like Pagliacci, Pennywise, and Pogo were, despite slaying their audience with their routines, giving a bad name to the profession. So then, this host turned to tarot card reading and hypnosis. Despite earning some minor acclaim in London as Madame Simza, your host simply didn't have the chops and was forced to turn to the only option left, a master's in business administration. Surprisingly, it was an easy fit. Tarot cards which illuminate your past, clarify the present, show the future, had taught me everything I needed to know about finance. The card temperance, when inverted, is indicative of volatility. If one draws the fool, someone has been led astray, an investment fraud. The two cups, it represents a powerful bond, a sovereign bond. Your podcaster learned about hypnosis too. Except the economics professors used different terms for it. Expectations policy, forward guidance, moral suasion. Wow, 
Wow, there are some dark themes in that one. The rest of the introductions are not that dark. Did you catch that section about the murderous clowns? And then the whole part about Giuseppe Grimaldi. That's no uh, exaggeration. That was the father of Britain's most famous clown. And he was terrified of being buried alive. And he did ask his daughter to cut his head off when he was pronounced dead just to be certain that he wasn't buried alive. Whew. Well, moving on to number nine. Number nine goes to one of the original introductions all the way back in episode 15, which was called, Hey Kid, Want Some Communism? And that was posted on June 27th, 2020. 20. Published in 1862, Les Miserables by Victor Hugo is the novel of the century, according to David Bellows, professor of French and comparative literature at Princeton University. When asked on the Great Books podcast, what qualifies this novel to be on the show, Bellows responded, quote, it tackles a huge range of human experience with an enormous amount of passion. If there ever was a great book, it must be Les Miserables. The story focuses on the suffering ones, the humiliated. It's set in the social, political, and economic upheaval of early 19th century France. The poor people who are worthy of our pity were caught up in the consequences of what Jeff Snyder calls the first modern business cycle. Michael Pettis in his 2001 book, The Volatility Machine, identifies it as the first modern deglobalization, and Frederick Engels called it the first general crisis. Engels is, of course, the co-author of the Communist Manifesto, published in 1848 in response to the shocking worldwide disorder. Karl Marx and Engels are said to suggest that capitalism has an expiration date, that capitalism was an ahistorical phenomenon which would burn up the limited fuel of labor and then sputter. And at that point, communism would take over and redistribute the existing wealth equitably because there was a limit to human wealth creation. This, over the long sweep of history, is a pessimistic view of human character and potential. But humans don't live across history, they have a handful of decades. And when capitalism does find itself in a cul-de-sac, as it did during the first general crisis, and the long depression, and the great depression, and now this, year 13 of the silent depression, well then, terminal capitalism sounds perfectly reasonable. In this, the 15th episode of Making Sense, Jeff Snyder discusses the barricades and autonomous zones of Les Miserables, Marx and Engels' thesis, late-stage capitalism, the Soviet Union, and present-day China, but all in defense of capitalism, without denying that it is going down the wrong road, toward the barricades. Lovely. Okay, so number nine was an educational introduction, number ten was an absurd introduction, and now number seven will be the first metaphor, which I often use in these introductions. And this one, it rests, where do I go when I want to do a metaphor? If it isn't a zombie movie, if it isn't about a lady wearing an evening gown, bearing a scimitar in her right hand and a shotgun in her left, battling the undead, then the usual place I go with my metaphors is space. Space, the final metaphor. Why do central bankers offer spirographic retrograde answers? Because they operate within a Ptolemaic paradigm, a geocentric model of our monetary system in which the central bank is the hub around which all else revolves. Why is unobservable offshore credit fundamentally important? Because like dark matter and dark energy, this shadow money represents the broad majority of material and heat that constitute our monetary universe. 
which brings your podcaster to the 21st chapter of The Courage to Act, authored by Ben Bernanke. There, the former chairman defends the Fed's second quantitative easing in 2010 because of an economic false dawn. No mere rhetorical flourish. The false dawn is a regular astral phenomenon. Each autumn and spring, the northern and southern latitudes respectively will observe a triangular diffusion of light rising above the horizon. It seems to herald recovery from the darkness. But soul won't come. Not yet, at least. Light? Yes. But the wrong kind. Instead of a medley of warm colors refracted by the near atmosphere, the false dawn is a sterile white originating far beyond our Earth in cold space. Officially known as the zodiacal light, we witness interplanetary dust particles reflecting sunlight. Perhaps not surprisingly, Bernanke's book had no further chapters on economic false dawns, despite their taking on an astronomical regularity, arriving again and again and again in 2011, 2014, and 2017. Jeff Snyder, part-time monetary sleuth and full-time Cosmos student, recognizes the difference between Reflation's false dawn and Recovery's warm glow. In this, the 56th episode of Making Sense, we review the light coming over the horizon from negative repo rates, surging M2 money supply, and rising U.S. Treasury yields. We find it cold and fallow, gray. That's episode 56, coming in number 8 on our Top 40 Countdown, only available here on KQQE-FM. That one's posted on March 15th, 2021, and it's dedicated to all you lovebirds out there. Moving on to number 7 is episode 34, which was released on the 11th of November, 2020. It's titled, The Social Contract. The intro tells you what a social contract is, some recent versions, as well as a little story about one of the originals. A social contract is the agreement between government, business, wealthy, and ordinary households in how to apportion the costs and benefits of society. The recently concluded American elections come to mind as a potential first step towards a new Green Deal. In this, the 34th episode of Making Sense, Jeff Snyder identifies another, less obvious, freshly fashioned contract, China and its recent 14th five-year plan. But as Snyder explains, question marks are not unique to democratic republics. Communist republics have them too. The most successful contemporary social contract your podcaster is aware of are the early 2000s hearts reforms in Germany. Listeners may be surprised to learn that before them, today's quote-unquote economic engine of Europe was the quote-unquote sick man of Europe. The decade-long assimilation of East Germany had taken a heavy toll, and unemployment levels would reach more than 10% in 2004. The new social contract ensured employment in return for low wage growth that favored business. So, success doesn't mean cost free. But we've always known these deals are difficult. Remember the story of one of humanity's original contracts? As we learn in Exodus, Moses had to introduce the commandments twice. The stone tablets were angrily shattered in the first attempt. And by the time the second draft was presented, the scene was rather tense. Firstly, God was annoyed as all get out to see Moses again. What, he doesn't have anything else to do other than hew stone tablets? Secondly, Moses was ill-tempered that he couldn't leave the chosen people alone for a few days before they started chugging flagons like Frank the Tank. Lastly, the people like the teenager, unable to thread the needle in a way that explained bongs and brassiers strewn across the yard to her parents, 
were anxiously awaiting judgment. When Moses returned for the second time, the apprehensive throng gathered before him. Moses announced, I have good news and bad news. The good news is I have got him down to ten, and a great cheer of relief issued forth. The bad news is adultery stays. Super great. That introduction shows that we don't know what we're doing because, first of all, the show brings to question whether or not the people in charge on Earth are doing a good job, so we're making enemies there. And then with that introduction, I cross the sacrilegious line, and now I'm going to have to answer for that when I meet St. Peter. So I'm putting my soul on the line for you people. I hope you can appreciate it. And if you don't, then check out this next introduction, because I know you're going to appreciate this one. This one is one of my absolute favorites. Episode 17, Communism. Don't call it a comeback. Posted July 11th, 2020. Plato, Kant, Nietzsche, Buddha, Confucius, Rousseau, Aristotle, Bastia, Molinari, Cicero, Hegel, Hobbes, Kant, LL Cool J. The contemporary philosopher sits on the social and political branch of the Western tradition. He began releasing treatises in 1985 after collaborating with Def Jam. Radio was his first. Two years later, bigger and deafer. But 1989's Walking with the Panther was too poppy, said the Philosophical Review. So much empty fluff, pondered the British Society for Feminology. Dialectica wouldn't even look at it. His fourth commentary, however, returned him to the top. Both the album and its most famous song were titled, Mama Said Knock You Out. The single famously begins with, Don't Call It A Comeback, I've Been Here For Years. Singing that tune these days are communism, Marxism, and socialism. In this, the 17th episode of Making Sense, Jeff Snyder explains how to understand their philosophy and why their recent popularity is not a comeback despite the doctrine's body of work. Marxism was never gone. It was waiting for the club of mostly wealthy nations to reach the end of their capitalist potential. Well, a 13-year depression on par with the 19th century's long and the 20th century's great depressions is making a good case. So then, how to counter the argument? But that's for the back half of the show. First, a catch-22 like paradox in bond markets. Safe sovereign and risky corporate bonds both display falling yields. Why? We look back to the last worldwide depression for answers. Then, yield curve control. This podcaster has a feeling it'll be the must-have toy for central bankers by Christmas. We look back at the U.S. experience with the policy during the 1940s. Then, Marx, Lenin, and Mao take the stage, grab the mic, and start spitting. Episode 24 comes in at number 5 on our countdown. It's called The Discovery of Oz. It's posted on August 31st, 2020. The Discovery of Oz is one of the first readings that I did. So in some of my introductions, I read almost verbatim from a piece of literature that I then substitute a few names, uh, I maybe add a little bit here and there, but it's essentially the exact same thing from a book. Another one I did was Macbeth, the scene wherein the weird sisters are mixing their potions in the cauldron. I wish that one made the top 10. It didn't. I have filed a grievance with the committee because I think it's fantastic. But all right, let us go with number five, episode 24. <laughs> I am Oz, the great and terrible. Why do you seek me? They looked again in every part of the room and then, seeing no one, Dorothy asked, Where are you? I am everywhere, but to the eyes of the common mortals I am invisible. I will now seat myself upon my throne that you may converse with me. 
We have come to claim our promise, O oh Oz. What we'll promise? You promised to send me back to Kansas when the Wicked Witch was destroyed. And you promised to give me brains, said the Scarecrow. And you promised to give me a heart, said the Tin Woodman. And y'all promised to give me courage, said the Southern Lion. Dear me, how sudden. Well, come to me tomorrow, for I must have time to think it over. You've had plenty of time already. We shan't wait a day longer. You must keep our promises to us. The lion thought it might be as well to frighten the wizard, so he gave a large, loud roar, which was so fierce and dreadful that Toto jumped away from him in alarm and tipped over the screen that stood in a corner. As it fell with a crash, they looked that way, and the next moment all of them were filled with wonder, for they saw, standing in just the spot the screen had hidden, a little old man with a bald head and a wrinkled face who seemed to be as much surprised as they were. Our friends looked at him in surprise and dismay. I thought the Oz was a great head, and I thought the Oz was a lovely lady, and I thought the Oz was a courageous Bernanke, and I thought the Oz was the green span put. No, no, you're all wrong, said the little man meekly. I have been making believe. Making believe? Are you not a great wizard? <laughs> Hush, my dear. Don't speak so loud, or you'll be overheard and I should be ruined. I'm supposed to be a great wizard. And aren't you? Not a bit, my dear. I'm just a common man. My dear friends, I pray you not to speak of these little things. Think of me and the terrible trouble I'm in at being found out. No one knows it but you four and myself. I have fooled everyone so long that I thought I should never be found out. But I don't understand, said Dorothy in bewilderment. How was it that you appeared to me as a great head? Hmm, that was one of my tricks. Step this way, please, and I will tell you all about it. The Southern Lion. It should be the Cowardly Lion, but I ran out of voices. And since I'm not a professional voice actor, I only have a few voices, and the Southern one seems to come out in all the voices that I do, and it's really hard to hold it back. And that's why I think we should just move on to next number in our countdown, number four, lest I embarrass myself anymore and that one is episode 21 what's in the monetary toolkit and it was posted on august 9th 2020 which is a special day in euro dollar history thank you so hard to see life is full of problems and when particularly irritated by them, we turn to professionals for help. Sure, men, especially the married kind, will insist they can take care of it. Plumbing? No problem. The Johnson rod is loose in the car? I got it. Open wound with compound bone fracture? Rub some dirt on it. Still, eventually even men will get to a point when they'll ask for directions. Because what can be done? They built the city all wrong. And so, when the technical expert is called, we damn well expect they've got a toolbox of specialized effective gadgets. For example, those tooth-yanking sadists are expected to make small talk about the marathon man while utilizing a tray of mouth mirrors, sickle probes, scalers, and saliva ejectors. Go to the stables and you'll see brushes, sweat scrapers, hoof picks, deworming pastes, fly bonnets, and liniments that will give your mare that glossy finish. One expects the same of our monetary technocrats. Their toolkit, you'd expect, to hold a printing press, bond certificates, gold, as well as maps and barometers identifying the specification, production, distribution, and utilization of modern money. In this 21st episode of Making Sense, Jeff Snyder tells us what is in the monetary toolkit after spending a professional lifetime reading meeting minutes, transcripts, and speeches. 
What's in there? Yeah, a magic eight ball, a rubber duck, prayer book, of course, half-eaten egg salad sandwich, and importantly, the phone numbers of financial journalists. Join us as we discuss the monetary toolkit through the lens of China's unchanging foreign exchange reserves, credit conditions in the United States, and PMI scores from around the world. Also, we end the show by holding a candlelight vigil for the 13th anniversary of August 9, 2007, the day that the global monetary order malfunctioned, a day that then CEO of the British bank Northern Rock said the world changed, a day that the Guardian newspaper analogized to August 4th, 1914, the start of the Great War, a day that has yet to end. I thought that was a nice musical flourish at the end there that matched the tone of August 9th and how it was all burning to the sky. But of course, choosing the music is risky, right? Because the audience has different musical tastes and I'm the only one in the studio. I'm the only one picking out the music. So there's no one there to put their hand on my shoulder and say, Emil, the... The, you're discussing the early 19th century, and I don't think that death metal music is appropriate in this circumstance. So I, I go with what I feel is good, and, and hopefully it's not the worst thing you've ever heard in your life. Which I don't believe these next three introductions are the worst thing you've ever heard. They all come from the same decile. They all come from the 30s. And the first one is episode 39 quantum dollar mechanics posted on december 14th 2020 your podcaster has long been impressed by cinema that presents what is outside the human sensory process art that conceives and presents what we literally cannot perceive in 2001 a space odyssey Stanley Kubrick shows us what transcendence is by sending Kier Dulea through an astral rainbow fall. Christopher Nolan's Interstellar presents Matthew McConaughey in a tesseract, the three-dimensional shadow of a four-dimensional space. In Annihilation, Alex Garland samples evolution by introducing a sentient prismatic cancer that refracts and reflects the DNA of its surroundings including that of Natalie Portman. The audience is placed in an environment that doesn't reconcile with daily life and leaves them holding on to reality, at least as they understand it, by their fingernails. The Euro dollar system is like that. Consider this legal word fall from the Financial Stability Board, quote, regulatory arbitrage in the presence of non-harmonized rehypothecation regimes. Or this three-dimensional shadow of offshore money by Jeff Snyder, quote, nobody buys securities, they borrow and claim to own them. Then the client will agree to allow the dealer to repledge the very security the client is claiming to own. The already repledged security can be repledged again in many, if not most cases, there needn't be the original client desire for this chain of repledging. If you want to know what it's like to travel through a wormhole for 18 hours in a hundredth of a second, like Jodie Foster did in Robert Zemeckis' Contact, then part one of episode 39 is for you. Parts two and three aren't the worst things in the world either. Well, this world at least. Quantum mechanics, I think, is a wonderful metaphor for the euro dollar system because I'm told it's true. It's hard to believe because my experience is with Newtonian physics, everyday, day to day life, Newtonian physics, just like the money that we deal with, is completely unlike the money that runs the global economy, the euro dollar system. And so Jeff serves as our resident physicist to help us through these 
bizarre truths of quantum dollar mechanics. Episode 30 is our number two introduction, and I had been waiting all year long to make this introduction, and then I blew it. I had an opportunity to do the introduction, and I forgot, I didn't realize, and it slipped by, and I was kicking myself, but I knew a moment would come again where I would be able to weave in this sort of intro, and I was looking for the smallest excuse, and it came in episode 30, which was posted on October 12th, 2020. The title of it was QE2 Syndrome, Making Economics Errata. As your podcaster put the finishing touches on episode 30, word came down from up on high. We need to do errata. Yes! Finally! This podcaster's longtime goal would be a reality to make economics erotic again. To tell the world that economists can stimulate. To inform that offshore bankers do it in the shadows. To broadcast that technical analysis has the best curves with those plunging chart necklines. The undulating data, the heaving economic activity, going long treasuries, wanting yield. Oh yeah, pile that yield on. Yeah, high and deep. Yeah, yeah. Alas, when the new intro copy was handed in for proofreading, This podcaster's confusion was laid bare. Errata, it's all about copy editing and mistakes. The ancient Latin word is plural for erratum, a correction of a published text. And indeed, in part three of this episode, the article under discussion was originally printed as Inflation Targeting, You Can Me Al. What? It should have been inflation targeting. You can call me, Al. And that's not all. Closely related to errata is corrigenda, a plural Latin word for a thing to be corrected, typically an error in a printed book. Whereas an erratum is, as a general rule, issued for a production error, a corrigendum is a mistake by the author. And in part three, Jeff Snyder and I introduce Al Broadus, the former Federal Reserve Bank of Richmond president. And when we segue to a quote about inflation targeting by Fed Governor Edward M. Gramlich, instead of attributing it to Gramlich, we continue to refer to Broadus. We hope you forgive the erratum and the corrigendum and how we piled them high and deep in this episode. Oh yeah. smoke a cigarette after hearing that introduction well ladies and gentlemen number one on our list is coming up but do you ever watch that youtube channel where they do the top 10 movie countdowns the top 10 deaths the top 10 sci-fi bad guys the top 10 love affairs of 19th century period pieces and right when they get to number one they say here's an honorable mention yeah Cheating, rude, inappropriate, okay? Work harder next time to get it down to 10. Don't just try to fit in a few more because you couldn't decide. Uh, that being said, I, I have to mention a couple of honorable mentions. And the first one is an introduction. It was in episode 28 where Jeff Snyder and I interviewed Brent Johnson. It was our very first interview. That was posted on September 27th, 2020. Now, unlike all the other introductions that you've heard already, this one is live. Live. This is exactly what Brent heard, what Jeff heard. Afterwards, I threw in some sound effects, some music, but the words you hear are live. And this is an honorable mention Episode 28. 
Hello, everyone. 1969, Johnny Carson was hosting The Tonight Show, and one particular episode featured Bob Hope. It was a good show, of course, and the next guest Carson called out was George Goebel. But to the surprise of everyone, Goebel didn't come out. It was none other than the Italian crooner himself, Dean Martin. Now, as it was Martin's style at the time, he was already two cognacs in to the next day's hangover, so it made for a rocking good show. Eventually, Goebel made it out on stage, and he promptly complained to Carson, saying, I'm coming out last. I have to share the stage with all these stars. And then he looked into the camera and he said, do you ever feel like the whole world's a black tuxedo and you're a pair of brown shoes? Now you know what I feel like. Let me introduce Bob Hope and Dean Martin. Welcome guys to the show. Thanks for having me. Good morning, Emil. We are very excited to have with us Brent Johnson. Thank you, Jeff. Yeah, exactly. That was Brent Johnson. And now the other interview that we've done, we've only done two, but it also is worthy of an honorable mention. And this was the episode before this one. And that was episode 58, posted on March 22nd. And here it is. Welcome to Making Sense. Jeff Snyder and I are joined by a very special guest, Isabella Kaminska, who has accomplished many things, including being the editor of FT Alphaville, the Financial Times blog. Though to refer to Alphaville as a mere blog would be a gross disservice. No, ladies and gentlemen, it's much more than that. It's the modern day equivalent of the 17th century London coffee house. Both forums for transactions, spirited debate, the exchange of information, ideas, and lies, though Alphabet is there pointing them out for our benefit. Strangers, no matter what their social standing or political allegiance, are always welcome into lively convivial company. The topics then, like now, the stock exchange, insurance, auctioneering, politics, arts, then the not-so-old masters, now NFTs. Both the contents of the 17th century coffee mug and Alphaville could be described the same way. Black as hell, strong as death, sweet as love, and shot through with grit. Isabella, welcome to the show. Well, thank you for having me. That was possibly the best introduction I've ever had. Thank goodness. Thank you, Isabella. Oh my gosh. It's, it's a close call because you go on a podcast, you go and you present somewhere, someone introduces you and they read off your resume and they tell about all the impressive things that you've done, which is great, wonderful, very exciting, good. But for me, it's missing soul. It's like going to a party or a Christmas or Hanukkah or Ramadan gift exchange and you get someone a gift card there's no soul so hopefully this but then again if you think about it what did i call brent johnson i likened him to a drunk dean martin and then isabella thanks sweet moses she didn't get upset when i said that her work was black as hell strong as death sweet as love and shot through with grit of course i mean it out of all love and respect but Thankfully, they took it well. I'm glad they did. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you for listening to me. Without further ado, let us move to the number one introduction of season one of Making Sense. It was episode 33, posted on November 2nd, 2020, and it was called Euro Dollar Ween. Broadcasting from the Kingdom of Nye. I'm Art Bell. This is Coast to Coast AM from the Great Beyond. (laughs) Tonight, we'll talk to 
General Johnson Jamison from his bunker complex beneath the Saskatchewan crust as to whether Y2K can still happen. Then, <laughs> do you want to believe? The government doesn't want you to. Chris Carter, creator of the X-Files, will tell us exactly which episodes the government didn't want you to see. Also, Rod Sterling will join me live in studio, <laughs> well, in a manner of speaking. Was the Twilight Zone a documentary that had to be presented to the public as fiction? <laughs> Time on Earth is indeed very short. No matter how old or young you are, you're a tiny slice of the overall cosmos plan. You're here for a very, very short time. We all are. And the big question, of course, is what happens after we end this physical life? <laughs> or it is ended, however you have it. It's a big question. And October, of course, is a great time to explore that question because one of the main things you look for is some, any evidence of life beyond the physical, the supernatural, the apparition, the unexplained, the Kachina doll that seems to move around the house by itself. <laughs> and there's no place more spooky and unexplained than central banking and the monetary order. Let us then enter another dimension, a monetary realm, let us turn to the wild card line. Jeff, Emil, can you hear me? This is our bell. That is a combination of two radio shows. The Art Bell Show, which was broadcast in the middle of the desert from Nevada by himself. Art was all by himself broadcasting in the middle of the night talking about ghost stories. It was the X-Files meets the Twilight Zone and it was fantastic and creepy because you're in the middle of the night and he's alone. Who knows what will happen to him? He's talking about scary stuff. Maybe someone will take him off the air. So it was wonderful. And the second show that that is, that, that introduction, was in reference to is the Phil Hendry Show, which is a character satire lampoon show. I won't reveal the punchline to you, but I will tell you that it is the most unique radio show being broadcast in America and probably the world today and for many years. And what he used to do was he would do skits of Art Bell. Anyway, so I guess what I'm saying is that it is a lot of inside baseball super radio nerd. But that's what I tried to do. I thought it was pretty good. And I just wanted to thank you all for your support for this past year, your continuing support. I am looking forward to meeting all of you in person one, one day. And in the meantime, let's meet each other on Twitter and on YouTube. You can find me at Emil Kalinowski on Twitter. On YouTube, you can go to the Emil Kalinowski YouTube channel. Jeff, you can find at Jeff Snyder underscore AIP. And I want to thank Jeff, even though he's almost certainly not going to hear this part. I just wanted to thank him for agreeing to do this madness, for humoring me with my unorthodox introductions, segues, readings of literature and poetry in the middle of the show. It doesn't make sense, but he's enjoying it too. So it's wonderful to have him as part of the team. And David Parkins, the illustrator for our show, his work is the best in financial media. And I'm thinking lately his work might be the best lampoon, satire, caricature in media, period. We'll see if I'm capable of putting together another top 10 list next year. I'm looking forward to it. Take care, everyone, and I will see you on the interwebs.